Hi there, and welcome to the COVID-19 Fireside Chat here at OCD Game Changers Facebook page. Welcome and happy Friday to you. I was just telling my husband earlier, I cannot, I woke up and I thought it was Wednesday. <laughs> and he was like, no, in fact, it's Friday. And then I was like, oh crap, I have to make a meme for today. <laughs> so that's why it went out a little bit late because I forgot what day it was. <laughs> so, so Friday's meme day? Well, for the fireside chat, I usually get them out really early in the morning and I woke up and I'm all yada, yada, yada. And then I was like, crap. Um, anyway, my name is Christy Hodges. I'm the executive director and the founder of OCD Game Changers. I'm the author of Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. And I'm also a certified peer support specialist here in the state of Colorado. I help support people worldwide who live with OCD. And I also help connect people worldwide to therapists and resources that can help them move toward recovery if they're struggling with OCD. So thank you for being here. And our guest today is Mike Hetty. Yay! Thank you for being here, Mike. I'll let you introduce yourself. Great. Um, can everyone tell that Chrissy's practiced at introducing herself? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Mike Hetty, uh, co-director of the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Institute of Maryland. Uh, we're right outside of Baltimore City. Of course, now we're all telehealth, so I guess we're kind of everywhere virtually. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in practice for uh, a little over 13 years treating OCD and anxiety disorders and the things that accompany those. Um, and I'm um, really happy to be here. Good, good. Well, I found out about you, I think it was through what I like to call the BFRB group. The BFRB group. <laughs> Yeah. Somehow I forgot. I think my co-director, Saris, uh, invited me to that group and I was weary because, you know, Facebook groups. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah. This is a great group. It is. So the um, it's a, a private group for therapists and people who treat OCD. I'm invited because not because I treat OCD, but because I am a professional supporting people with OCD. And it is it. Um, it was founded by Michelle Massey and Allison Solomon. And I remember getting in there and thinking, wow, there's never any discourse. Like people are not mean. Yeah. <laughs> people are actually civil. There's no, you know, horrible talk about, you know, doing hypnotherapy for OCD. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the harsh I th harshest I think it ever gets is when, when people have like these really detailed nuanced difference about exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, that's good, you know? Yes, exactly. So um, it was good to meet you through that group. And I always appreciate your commentary. And uh, for those of you that are joining us today, what these are, the fireside chats, it, it, I created these once COVID happened, mainly because I was struggling. I didn't know what was the right way to feel, how I should be reacting. And I thought, what better way if I'm struggling, that means other people are struggling. What better way than to bring together people that are in our community, that are therapists for OCD, that are advocates, individuals with OCD, uh, family members that can come and just give us some guidance on normalizing how to feel when everything is really uncertain, which it is right now. Um, I'll get in a little bit later how it's been feeling for me this week. I had a bit of a breakthrough Wednesday, which is good and kind of not good. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. But anyway, Mike, how has this been for you? It's been two over two months now. We're, we're like two months, a little like two months and five days since everything really shut down all over. What has the experience been like for you? Uh, you know, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, to be honest with you. Um, I started out with my impressions about what was going to happen with COVID uh, like three weeks or so before the shutdown at a staff meeting. All of us were kind of talking about how, like, let's calm down. Like, it's not a big it, it's a it's a big deal, but it's not going to be a, like everyone was sort of, you know, doom and gloom about it. And then, like, within a few weeks, it was sort of like, oh, this is this is more real than I guess I had anticipated it. It, it, uh, the full weight of it kind of started hitting me like, Oh, like people I know could get really sick or die from this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was kind of like back and forth in the beginning and, um, you know, the, 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 the awkward time of this was my cat got really sick. I have two cats. One might burst in the room. 
who knows. <laughs> I but would love the, that. My one cat got really, really sick, and we ended up having to put her down the day after the quarantine oh, started. No. Um, so it's like, that was like, that put me through a weird place. Like I wasn't quite tuned into COVID as much that week. And then we had to move our entire clinical practice online, mm -hmm. you know, and we have like 19, 20 clinicians. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, we're all sort of in offices every day and moving everything online and dealing with all of that, which is kind of a first world problem when you think about how can I turn my business online. Um, but still it was, it was bizarre. Still a change. And then, uh, of course, you know, like my, you know, family members, um, wondering if they have coronavirus cause they're pretty sick for a couple of weeks and it turns out they don't. Um, my sister who's uh, an ICU nurse. Um, oh, wow. And, yeah. And I'm, you know, how she's handling things and talking with her on occasion about what's going on there. Um, and my parents are, are in the, the, the older age They're My dad's in his seventies and, and they both have underlying health conditions and, um, worrying about, you know, are, are they as informed as they should be and getting my anxious brain going about, are they taking the right precautions, mm -hmm. all that stuff. And I've noticed from like eight weeks ago until today, like precautions changing, maybe mm -hmm. not like not the recommendations from the CDC. I think that's been fairly straightforward, but just the, the, the individual, uh, you know, um, decisions people are making based on their own risk groups. Some people are wiping their groceries down. Some people are washing their produce with, with soapy water. Um, and, and other people are doing, uh, uh, varying degrees of, of protocols, um, and watching mind change over time was interesting like i was like mm -hmm. i'm gonna be hardcore cdc not gonna let my anxiety take over here just 20 seconds of hand washing after i handle things um and i was like i'm still gonna go to the grocery store i'll just use protocols and then like now it's like instacart and mm -hmm. you know i'm not quite wi wi wiping my ego waffle boxes down with with uh, wipes yet but uh I i've i'm still trying to maintain that cdc protocol but you know, it's difficult, mm -hmm. I think, especially sort of when there's a lot of free time to be in your head. Yeah. Um, and oh, hello. Of, I, I have OCD. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so the interesting uh, imagination that, that occurs there can get us, can get us lost. Yes. Yes. No, that's funny. As, as I'm listening to you, I'm like, oh my God, he's describing what it's like to live with OCD. <laughs> except for this is in kind of real time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's been an interesting time. You know, I'd say like, personally, I haven't been really in, uh, impacted beyond like nuisance things. Mm -hmm. um, like this is my guest room slash office. Yeah. And my biggest concern right now is finding a more comfortable computer chair. Um, and, and apparently everyone else had the same idea as I did. Mm -hmm. So you can't buy a computer chair anywhere. Apparently it's like yeast, you know? Um, so that's that, you know, that's, you know, a little bit joking there, but yeah, I, I worry more about my family than myself. And um, I thought I was going to be much more of a, of a hardcore, I'm going to go out to the store just to go out to the store and challenge myself. But I've actually gone to the route of mm -hmm. food, food delivery and, you know, which is different than what I thought I was going to do. So it's all an interesting learning experience. I think it is an interesting, and I, I like how you brought it up. The just the decisions that people are, are making based on uh, risk and how they approach risk, and you know, I am pretty lax about things in, in regards to it. But we're pretty far removed from it. We see what's going on, but we have to be mindful of not seeing too much or we get caught up in the social media frenzy of it and, and the news and the panic. Um, it, it's, I think it is interesting and I think it's going to continue to show just how, you know, the first fireside chat we did was Dr. Stephen Phillipson. And he, this was like the week after all hell broke loose. And he was like, humans are like monkeys <laughs> and, and a, you know, the pack in the trees or whatever. And we, we need the connection. We need to be with each other and humans aren't going to stay in this 
this way for long. And he, uh, you know, according to several states, including my own, he's correct. People are starting to go, you know, wh whether it's conspiracy theory or not, it doesn't, I'm not even going to go there, but people are just starting to get to a point where they're like, I don't care. Like I'm going to risk it. Um, I don't endorse being irresponsibly risking it. Like I'm going to open my restaurant and, you know, defy everything and F everybody and this and that, like a few places have done here, but it goes to show how things are, the cogs are starting to turn and people are just going to start saying, I don't care. I'm going to risk it. What do you think that's all about? You know, I think the longer you are immersed in something almost like a habituation effect here the the beginning of it makes you feel the worst of it it's like i'm gonna keep myself safe i'm gonna follow things and as weeks and weeks go by um you start having different stories introduced to that process and you start thinking your liberties are being taken away mm -hmm. um that it isn't as bad as we thought it was so that must mean that maybe the the idea of social distancing doesn't need to occur and you get a lot of interesting arguments about e e economy versus public health um and you know i've heard both from clients and and um and family members about their vantage points on this psychologically i think it, it it has a lot to do with you know we all desire uh connection um we all don't have the same calculus when it comes to risk mm -hmm. you know and i mean if you're talking to someone who's in their 60s with with heart disease their their risk calculus is probably quite different than mine correct um and so I think there's some of that going into it. I think there's a lot of misinformation floating around um, and people get into their silos mm -hmm. and uh, the echo chambers persist. And then once yes. you get, once you get uh, 10 or 15 people who agree with you, um, then that's going to encourage you to, to do behaviors that, that you might not otherwise have done if everyone disagreed with you. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I just, I love to talk about the risk piece because not that I didn't think of it. I mean, I am here in my own kind of echo narrow minded chamber with husband, but I, I didn't really think of it that way. And, you know, in our scenarios, you are probably closer to a, a bigger area that's hot, that people can get infected easier versus where I am kind of not, well, not really out in the middle of nowhere, but we're, we're between two big cities. So I go out to the grocery store. It's, I'm not around that many people anyway. I'm going to tell you something though. I've always washed, washed my vegetables with soap and I have been made fun of for doing that. So everybody that said, made fun of me and now are doing it, they can all F off. <laughs> now, granted, mine was a compulsion. <laughs> So, well, I, yeah. So, so there's that because I was, I was going to say like, I don't like when I have to wash my vegetables, it's because my wife's like, did you wash that? And it's just like soap. It's, it's, you know, it's ceremonial at best. Like I'm going to get it wet and that's going to do something. And then I'm going to dry it off and cook it. And I'm just like, can we just skip the middleman and just like cook the damn thing? Like if there's like a piece of dirt on it, I'll wipe it off. And it's kind of the way a lot of, I think a lot of people wash their hands, which is just ceremonially. You know, but, but now that we're in, you know, we, we honor the, the sort of wet hands. I kind of got my hands wet. Um, the person in the stall is going to think I washed them. Um, <laughs> and, and, but now it's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta count to 20 and use soap. And mm -hmm. I think people have actually switched. I, 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 I'm starting to see that, uh, at least clinically, people are actually really washing their hands. Um, uh -huh. you know, not the people, not the people who had sort of uh, contamination OCD with hand washing compulsions, but just people who never worried about hand washing before now actually are. I imagine so. And, and I think the interesting thing, oh, I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud, is that I am doing less compulsions when I go to a grocery store now than I ever did before. Even still with my emetophobia, my fear of vomiting, it's, I mean, it's not debilitating and I still live my life. It's not like I really need to ERP it every day, but I do less compulsions and I feel like I'm almost doing them defiantly to my own brain. Isn't that bizarre? Yeah. I mean, a bizarre, I don't know. That feels judgmental to say, but it's interesting. You can say it. I don't feel judged. You can even judge me and I don't care. 
you know, I think, I think, you know, similarly to a lot of people who have OCD and who experience this, you know, the things that they, <clears throat> that they get hooked into, pardon me, <clears throat> coronavirus, um, <laughs> the things they get hooked into, um, can, can switch, can change. It's sort of like, what's the low hanging fruit for the OCD mm -hmm. to, to grab a hold of at any particular time. And, um, so I don't know that it's always congruent. I don't know that it's always like, oh, I have, I have some emetophobia, I have some contamination OCD, so the pandemic is going to definitely exacerbate that. I don't know that that's always true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for some people it's absolutely true. They they're having a really hard time separating out sure. how to how to function. And then there's other people. It's like you know, my contamination stuff is fine because I haven't really left the house. Um, Right. I have a lot of clients that have to, are, that are doing way better because in all honesty, they don't have to go out and face some of the things that are, you know, aggravating their intrusive thoughts. Mm -hmm. And even some of the people with contamination stuff, uh, it's not about viruses. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like they're worried about other kinds of, of contaminants and it's not the virus. So they can go to the store, follow standard protocols and they're fine. They're still concerned about other contaminants, just not the virus. And that's, right. that's, that's, I think that speaks to what OCD is, right? It's not, absolutely. it's not a rational process. Right. I read something this morning. I, I, I'm going to put it out there and I've been ERPing it all day. I did read that the virus shows up in kids with vomiting and diarrhea. And I was like, oh my God. And so of course, then I'm like, what if, Coop, what, like Sean's son, what if Cooper gets it? And, he bring, and then I was like, but then what if he vomits? But he's not even a kid anymore. And then even if I got it, it wouldn't come up that way, like as an adult. But it, I caught myself going, well, now you need to start being more precautious. And then I was just like, oh, whatever. If, but, but of course, if the virus did include vomiting, like this would be a whole other issue. <laughs> well, and, and the thing is, is that's another thing that's been interesting about this process um, and scary about this process is the first two weeks that I think most of us were aware of it, it was the, the dreaded four symptoms, right? It was like, mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is before not being able to smell and taste were around as a symptom that came a little bit later. And mm -hmm. okay, so now we have those symptoms and it's like, okay, we keep adding possibilities Right. which for someone who doesn't have anxiety or OCD is difficult enough, but it increases yeah. for people with intolerance for uncertainty and, and uh, concerns about, you know, how can I know I won't spread this to other people or how do I know I'm not sick? You keep adding symptoms to it. And the next thing you know, it's kind of like someone who might have like a panic disorder. Every symptom could be a panic attack or a heart attack. And, and mm -hmm. or how do I know the difference? It's like, you know, uh, you almost mm -hmm. have to have to know what a heart attack feels like to be sure what the difference is. And even then, mm -hmm. you know, so I mean, the, the more they stack up these, uh, these symptoms that are showing up that might be related and there might be more that we find out, you know, six months from now, um, the, the murkier it gets about what we should look for. Absolutely. Especially if it mutates and continues to mutate. Yikes. It's like yeah. the zombie yeah. apocalypse. <laughs> I mean, not really, but it is, you know what I was thinking about before, this is why I brought the zombie apocalypse up. When you were saying before, <laughs> I don't know why this came to my mind and I'm a big Walking Dead fan. Well, seasons one through five, I, I've been off on and off since. Do you watch The Walking Dead? You know, I watched the first two seasons of The Walking Dead and then I got bored. Yeah, well, you'd get bored after season five for sure. But I think the funny, not funny, but the interesting thing is as you were, <laughs> as you were talking, <laughs> I was the same way you were the week before everything went, it was the week of game changers. And so I was, I, I literally was like, y'all don't believe the hype. Y'all come on out. If you don't come like you're ridiculous. <laughs> I didn't shame people. I swear maybe in my mind, but not, uh, not, in, not in person because literally all of us thought this was weird hype. And then you were sitting there going, I, <laughs> I was talking to my staff and we were going, oh, this isn't this a big of a deal, yada, yada, yada. And then a week later, well, in the zombie apocalypse world, that week would have taken out what? Like 90% of it. <laughs> yeah, right. If this were if this were a, a movie or a TV show, for sure. Yeah. Especially it's, if they were running zombies like they were in 28 days, 28 days later, that movie. Yeah. Yeah, you 28 days, that? I think 28 days was a Sandra Bullock movie, I think, where she went into <laughs> rehab. But 28 days yes. later was a, was a yeah, it's a good, good movie. Scarier zombies when they're not sauntering around. 
you know? Yes, when they're running after you and barfing blood. Uh huh. That could be <laughs> a bit scary. Um, I don't know why I brought up zombie apocalypse, but it just occurred to me when you were talking about it, and I was like giggling in my mind. I do have something that I wanted to bring up, and I think this would, I it, I would be interested to hear your perspective as somebody who treats OCD and deals with uh, not deals with, but works with people with anxiety. I was trying to explain to my friend the other day, kind of some, not really anger, but frustration that I have at this pandemic. A lot of it around kind of the emotional shaming people are doing. If you don't do this, then that, or, you know, also the way that the media is portraying things. And I'll give you the example and, and, and how it relates to me. And Chris Trons and I, on our fireside chat, we talked a lot about this, about how the confusion of this pandemic is present it's it's presenting confusion for those of us with ocd that have done erp you know faced uncertainty and found out you know that it's it's all about anxiety and not fear whatever you know what i'm saying everybody else knows what i'm saying too um so <laughs> um when i drive down the road and i see the signs that say stay home um and save lives there i get in, like a visceral anger reaction from that. And I didn't really understand it until I started to do these fireside chats and talking to people and how, and also seeing a lot of people finally start opening up with OCD and, and, and being able to express how they feel about the, the virus stuff. And I was trying to explain it to a friend the other day. It was, you know, in growing up with scrupulosity, there was very much this feeling of if I don't do this, then this will happen, which ruled my life. Every decision I made, every turn, every everything was, well, if I don't do this. And it was, of course, it was like burn in hell for eternity, which is, you know, that's probably worse than the coronavirus, I guess. And, it's a little you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess so could the coronavirus too. But, you know, in finding therapy for OCD and, and seeing, I do not ever have to ever have to look at the or else again, and, and not in a non-responsible way, but just how shaming that is to say, if you do, or if you don't do this, this will happen and it will be all of your fault. I started to recognize why that visceral reaction is there. And I'm starting to hear clients say the same things of they feel Probably that's why I feel very defiant uh, is, you know, I dealt with this for so long. I finally figured out how to find freedom through the hardest part of this. And now all of a sudden I'm driving down the road and it's like, if you leave your house, you're going to kill somebody. What are your thoughts on that as far as treating and also, you know, from maybe what you've heard from your clients? Well, yeah, I've, 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 I think the, the bulk of my clients tend to err on the side of, of, Sort of the public health crisis argument and i'm going to put them maybe unfairly in those two camps the economic open up argument and the public health stay closed and be safe mm -hmm. argument um i do have a number of clients that have, have gone through the, the other way and not focusing on the public health so much and um wanting to to, to get out and you tend to see a tribalism that can pop uh -oh. up sorry oh, that's fine <laughs> I'm, uh, I've, we've got weird comments going on, so I'm just trying to get rid of them. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, you go ahead though. <laughs> uh, so there's a tribalism, I think that, that can show up. And I think a lot of has to do with sort of the vantage point um, that people have. Like if you're in a high risk group, if you've known someone who's died, um, then I think you're probably going to be pretty hardcore on the public health side of things, which is, you know, we know that, you know, one person that's asymptomatic can affect a, a number of other, in, you know, transmit to a number of other people and then they can transmit it and so on and so forth, this exponential growth. Um, and, and that can have the feeling of like, well, you're choosing to drink and drive if you're, if you're yes. like, it's sort of tantamount to that, right? You're, you're knowingly doing something that could hurt someone I care about or myself. So why the hell are you doing that? And I, I think that there's, there's a point to be made there, although they somewhat maybe of a hyperbolic point. And, and on the other side, I think there's the, the argument for people who's like, listen, like I'm not a horrible, bad person. Um, I'm taking my own calculated risk. Like I think we should be able to go out and do things. And, 
I was having this conversation with a, with a client a couple of days ago, and it was it was basically that like I don't I don't want to put other people at risk, um, but I've been working every single day because his job requires him to be mm -hmm. out working. Um, and, and he's like, so I've been exposed to this and he's not a first responder. He's just an essential employee that has to go out and do things. Mm -hmm. Um, and he looks at this from a different angle, but he's young and he's healthy. And I don't think he's had anyone experience sort of serious consequences of coronavirus directly. Um, so I look at this and I think, you know, I, I think there's, there's two potentially valid points that people can take way too far right you can you can become very polarized which is not new for our country to be polarized <laughs> and i think that people are just sort of hijacking this issue and polarizing it too right i think it's not as simplistic to say if you don't wear a mask while you're walking alone hiking you're killing people mm -hmm. that's that's not true right um mm -hmm. but if you're willfully going to a a public place and lingering because you're bored and you're not keeping six feet distance and you're not wearing a mask and you're throwing parties on the weekend. And, you know, and I just think that that's a different level of, mm -hmm. right. Of defiance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's easy for one side to caricature or straw man the other side. It's easy. Yes. for Right. And then the, this, this happens, right. Like shame on you yes. for, for, for going out and going to the grocery store still shame on you. Um, for doing things that I wouldn't do, right? Like, why why don't you act the way I would act? Yes. Yeah, I think I, that's what's so hard about it, and and it's you know I I think that that I, that hits the nail on the head. It's the I I don't even know if, if self righteous is the right way to put it, but just perceiving a situation a specific way for your own needs, and then projecting that on other people. That if you don't do it my way. And unfortunately, we're also in a an election year. That's always great. And those are never polarizing either. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Like my like my my own vantage point, not that other people care so much, is that, you know, I'm on I I lean towards the public health end, but I'm in a position that I, I would consider fortunate to be in that that place. You know, I still leave my house and take walks, go to the pharmacy and pick up medication. You know, um, I'm having most of my groceries delivered, but I can afford to do that. Mm -hmm. There are services in my area where you can get your groceries like within two or three days of ordering them. And mm -hmm. it's convenient. Um, I tend to be a somewhat, um, we'll just say I'm not outgoing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> right. So like it, it, it fits with my personality a bit. Um, and I, 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 you know, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is I think the public health argument has more pers is more persuasive to me, mm -hmm. but I can appreciate the fact that not everyone's in my economic position, not everyone's in my health position, um, and and that there are valid viewpoints on the other side, and it's too easy to demonize people and mm -hmm. not listen to them and not hear what they're actually saying. Mm -hmm. Of course, the people who are like let the old people die because I need to go back to work and I want to do trivia with my friends. I don't think anyone agrees with that, at least in large measure. Um, right. <laughs> I, 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 I think that some people would agree with that. I I'm certainly not one of them. <laughs> yeah. And we're not, not, we're not and it's certainly not talking about those, but I'm not defending that position in yeah. the least. I'm just simply <laughs> saying that, you know, this idea of I'm, I'm right. Um, and you're evil. Yeah is not helpful. I, I correct. I agree with that. I do have a question, you know, LA just extended their stay at home for three months. Did you know that? I did not know that until August. And, um, already had clients reaching out and even friends going, this is, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do this, you know, um, and it, it isn't even related my, the clients that have reached out isn't related to the OCD symptoms. It's just the isolation, especially people who are living alone. And my hope is, is that other places won't have to follow suit and that it just is because it's so, you know, it's, it's just such a congested area that that's why, but if, and you know, we're already hearing things like schools being canceled, sporting events for the fall, you know, what do you think, I don't even know what I want to ask, but I guess along the lines of like, 
how do you think mental health, what, what is going to happen to the, to mental health in the next three, four, five, six months, if this continues? Um, and, and then a follow up would be, what can people do in, in, you know, what do you, what do you think is going to happen for people, especially with anxiety? And then the follow up would be, what can people do to help ease kind of that fear and, and panic about, I'm going to be cooped up for another three or four months? Yeah. So mental health, I mean, I think a lot of things are probably going to spike over the next, I mean, I think they already started, but I think we're going to see that continuing. And I, I've, I've spoken about this a, a few times, which is, of course, I think things are going to, I think depression might increase. I think anxiety might increase trauma, especially from first responders or people who've been unable to grieve the loss of family or friends, you know, these funerals that are virtual now, mm -hmm. um, all of that has been incredibly complicated and, and new. Um, the, the, the question is access to care. Yeah. Um, because that's, that's the economic question, you know, yep. either, either all of us can get reimbursed through insurance, which I don't take, you know, I'm a private pay mm -hmm. person. Um, you know, so can the economy, uh, support the, the people who are providing the care and what kind of change is that going to occur? And will the insurance companies keep funding the telehealth or will they back off? Right. Right. Um, and, and if, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I certainly have my my preference that they do. Um, I think they should extend out of network benefits too. Mm -hmm. you know, and and you know, um, but that's a longer conversation. I, as far as people being isolated, um, there's not an easy fix to that. I mean, if you don't isolate, it's hopefully with other people that you can guarantee have uh, have them themselves been 14 days free of contact with them, someone who might have had coronavirus and, and, you know, um, or you too can take your own, um, sort of informed risk and be around each other. Um, I suppose that there's sort of some wiggle room in there, but the people who want to honor the stay at home thing, but they're getting incredibly isolated and lonely and feeling distant and getting trapped in their head a lot. Cause there's just too mm -hmm. much time for that. Um, I think the, the advice um, is really sort of zoom out if you can, pause, zoom out, find some way to sort of snap you back into a perspective, um, sort of more global perspective and say, you know, I can't predict next week, let alone September. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really do me any good. And it, especially if you're prone to mental health concerns, there's rumination involved in in depression and ocd um and panic and you're just going to set a trap to ruminate about something that you can't control mm -hmm. so we need to back up and we need to focus on today tonight and tomorrow mm -hmm. um and we need to give ourselves a kindness to turn off the news to stop reading the twitter the twitter feed that people are talking about you know their predictions about what's going to happen and sort of the the minutia of the conversation as it carries on and just get, gather big points, you know, once a day, check in with the news for a few minutes. And then if it's nothing new, you turn it off. Um, I think that might be uh, a useful way of going about this. I mean, mm -hmm. people have already been doing that for mm -hmm. months and it might be going on for months more. Um, you know, I think, I think attitude makes a difference, you know, how you approach something. If you approach it, in this perspective of like, I'm being, you know, uh, I'm having my rights taken away or I'm, um, this is intolerable and, and, and there's no way I can get through it. That's going to impact your ability to respond to it in a way that's uh, helpful and effective. Um, and so sometimes it helps to sort of remind us that yes, we're cooped up and we're isolated and we're alone, but we are more connected than any other generation has ever been. Mm -hmm. And that not all of us, right? Some people don't have internet and they don't have access to this, but the people that do, we're more connected than we've ever been. This is not the World War II generation. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Where where people went off and they didn't come home for six years. Mm -hmm. You know, where where car factories shut down so they could make tanks. Mm -hmm. Um and again a subtle shift in sort of like the attitude of like, okay, like 
I can't predict the future. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of fear and a lot of like scary things are happening. That's true. And add on top of it, your own mental health issues plus isolation. Yeah, things are going to be really difficult. Mm -hmm. But if we only focus on how difficult they are, how unfair they are, how disconnected I feel, that's all you see, right? You get the horse blinders on. And, and yeah. we want to sort of take those off and be like, yes, those are true. And, you know, I could reach out. I can connect with people, even if it's virtually, even if it's not, you know, a fraction of what I want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, the attitude shift, the perspective shift, the reminding that uh, there, there's an end to this. We may not know exactly when it is, but there's an end. Mm -hmm. I think um, another, su another suggestion would be, uh, and I've talked about this in past fireside chats is how I didn't understand the loss of human connection and how important that was until I go out and, you're faced with people with masks and you can't see their expressions. And whereas I'm a pretty chatty person when I'm out, you know, even when I was distancing because of emetophobia, I was still chatty as long as people were away. <laughs> but uh, I make even more of an effort when I'm out now to even just say to somebody, Oh, I like your shirt or, you know, thank you. How's your day? You know, when I'm at the cashiers or if someone's, Oh, that looks like a good apple over there. I don't know. I'm just making that up. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great looking apple. Good, good selection. <laughs> nice onions you got there. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I, I've, I've made more of an effort now to just have conversations with people and, I can tell, and, and this may just be my imagination or just hoping that people feel this way, but I can tell that w when I talk to someone, they're eager to have that connection too, because it's this, oh, thank you. And how are you today? Or, you know, that's a great looking piece of corn you're holding. I don't know. But <laughs> I think that's another thing. It's so divisive when you can't see people's faces. It's so, it makes people feel even more like a stranger. And just the reminder that it's just a barrier. That's all it is. And there's still a human being underneath there. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I think there's probably a ton of research to back up this idea that, you know, as, as primates, as, as, you know, social creatures, facial expressions is incredibly important. The nonverbals are incredibly important. Um, whether you're talking about therapy and therapeutic alliance and feeling trust between the therapist and the patient, or you're talking about running into a neighbor on the street, facial expression means a lot. It and, does. And, and when you're only getting this, it's, it's, it is distancing in, in, an, I think somewhat of an unhelpful way, at least from a connection standpoint, it might be safe Absolutely. from a health Absolutely. standpoint, but it's, it's distancing. And I think when, you know, it's easy to sort of see this as this sort of you know, this safety net and, you know, this virtuous thing that we're doing, which, you know, I think there's an argument to be made that, that doing that is wise. I don't know if it's virtuous necessarily, but um, when you see someone else not doing it, you're like, you're like, what's that? What's, why are they not doing that? Like, what are you trying to get people sick? Mm -hmm. You know, like I walk around the neighborhood and, you know, it's not, a, it's not a busy neighborhood. I don't wear a mask when I'm walking around the neighborhood because, I'm outside and I'm not in groups of 10 or more people and I'm not in someone's slipstream while they're sneezing or coughing. So I figured I could, but I see people look at me not wearing a mask. Um, okay. if, I, if I go to the grocery store, I'll wear a mask, but I'm outside walking my neighborhood just myself or me and my wife and I don't need to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. um, but people look at you suspiciously. So I think you get that too, which is back to that idea of. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And here in, in Colorado, we're, we've got a lot of open space. You know, I live in a town that has a ton of trails, just national forests. We're backed up to the mountains. And um, luckily, we aren't under any sort of obligation to wear masks at all on trails. And we're not any, under any obligation to wear masks anywhere, actually. Um, in Colorado, it's suggested, but not required. And uh, it, it is the same, you know, when I'm out running and stuff. I just look so forward to running and going over to the incline. There's an incline in Castle Rock. It's 200 stairs up and down. And um, I look so forward to it because the the shift and how people interact with you when you're exercising now. I mean, before it's just like, 
and are like gruff, like er, you pass people on the trail and you're like, get out of my way mm-hmm. <laughs> or whatever else. And now it's almost like you stop, you don't stop, but you just, you have a moment where you look each other in the face and you smile and you can see, you know, it's like, oh my God, I'm interacting with a human being and not mm-hmm. a face mask. And it really, it's, yeah, you know, I rarely see anyone with masks on the trails. And, and that's, that to me is, is just, it's that little, and I, I want to encourage people, you know, find your place or find, find what brings you that, that small sliver of normalcy that you need. And, and, you know, here, you know, we, my town is called Palmer Lake. It's around a lake. And then there's a reservoir as well that you can hike up to. There's people go and they, they're with their families and they're around the lake. They're, they're enough distance from each other. However, it's that just that sense of seeing people walking by and people kayaking and doing things that if you do that and you go and sit there, it brings this sense of things are still happening. The world is still happening. I can still put my toes in the water if it's not freezing cold, like it has been, you know, or I can, I can still wade out there. I can still fly fish. I can still jump on my kayak or my canoe or, or just, you know, bask in the sunshine and, find that for yourself, whatever that is, if that's, you know, going and sitting under a tree and feeling the grass underneath you, or if it's video games, you know, whatever you need to do to figure out how to find that happiness for yourself and doing it every single day. I, yeah, I agree. Making that effort. Yeah. And, and again, you know, finding something that's, that's, you know, um, valuable to you um is is incredibly important and if that's going out and making contact with nature and then hiking or going fishing then then do that i think what gets lost in this conversation that people uh, we tend to be black and white thinkers especially people with anxiety but um the the country as a whole i think what gets lost is the context you know yes wear a mask in the context of being around a group of people where you can't be more than so many feet apart where you know like the, that's a context where, where a mask makes sense but if you're by yourself or there's five people around the lake and you're not wearing a mask you know again context matters now if everyone goes to the lake because they're all trying to make contact with with the lake and with nature and now you have 500 people around the lake okay so now we have to wear a mask because everyone had the same idea on saturday and now you're three, now you're three feet away and there's like 10 families with a bunch of four-year-olds running around. Um, you know, that's a whole different context. Um, and I can't even begin to touch sort of how we, how we navigate that. And I I think that's why we're all just taking our best guess based off of good information about what to do. Yes. Well, and I also think that that right there is the, what what is also getting lost in the conversation is people's ability to make those decisions. You know, I, in, in general, I wouldn't go to a lake that had 500 people around it because I just don't want to be around that many people. Um, but I also, you know, I think it's also horrible when you spend your entire day on social media, posting pictures of people by each other and saying, look at this jackass doing this because they want to kill people. You know, like I, I, I just get to this point where it's, yeah, there are things, but I've always thought that I think there are things that people do that, that are, you know, stupid in regards to like spreading illness, especially during neurovirus season. But, (laughs) but it's to me, it is the, my standards are here and this is what I do to keep myself and my family safe and keeping that at the forefront. You know, if, if one, you know, family is out there at the lake and then all of a sudden, you know, 200 people show up and they didn't know it. And before they know it, they're in that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're horrible people and they want everyone to die. <laughs> yeah, of course not. Yeah, of course not. It's, and, and I look at this and think, uh, you know, it's one thing to interact with neighbors and people around you in, in real time, real people who may or may not be shaming you publicly for doing something that they wouldn't have done. That's that's a different situation. I think that's actually harder to deal with mm-hmm. because these are the, these are real people, real interactions. Mm-hmm. Social media and and you know the 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 trolls out there on social media, um, a lot of group think, a lot of siloing, a lot of echo chambers, a lot of people just trying to get a rise out of you by, by saying things that are controversial and hyperbolic. And I look at that and I tell this to my clients all the time. It's just like, just turn it off. Mm-hmm. 
And I realize some people's jobs are based on social media and some people have to be on it. And uh, it's not all bad. Some, you know, social media contact isn't all bad. I mean, we're doing really good and we're on mm-hmm. social media, right? <laughs> um, and so, so, so again, context, but, you know, we, we could reconnect with the idea that there's more to what's going on in our lives, even though, even if we can't interact with people in groups outside of the screens that we get mm-hmm. attached to. Yeah. Um, I don't watch news anymore. I just gave up on the news. I, I, listen, we did too. To, I listen to a morning podcast and I, that's a trusted source. I like it. And it's like 10 minutes worth of news. And, and then whatever my clients tell me in, in, you know, first five minutes of our, you know, startup period in a session, they're like, can you, can you believe this? And I'm like, ah, didn't hear that. You know, <laughs> what's next? You know, well, like you didn't even know that California shut down till August. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm sure the more I process that I'll have, I'll have feelings about that, but. Yeah. Um, well, setting, I think setting limits and, and, you know, before we kind of wrap up and I get your final thoughts, uh, you know, I think getting, you know, kind of circling back to that question of what we, what can we do the longer that we, the longer we go with uncertainty about when this is going to quote unquote end. And I, I, I say that because we don't know what the end is and we, we do know that there's going to be a new normal. We just don't know what that looks like. And that's really scary to think that that that's going to take a while to build up to whatever things look like. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I, all I can do is share what works for me. I plan my week out every single Monday And it is, I'm going to exercise at these times on these days. And this is where I'm going to go and do it. And I just stick with it. And sometimes it's hard to get out of the house because when you isolate, you just get really comfortable in your little nest. And I'm always so grateful that I do not only because I get to see people on the trails and feel normal again, but just the release of endorphins and just connecting back to nature. The second thing is I am very much like you in the mornings I get up as I'm like drinking coffee and waking up. I scroll social media and then I'm done other than maybe posting things and then just maybe a quick run through. But like, I don't get on there for hours at a time. I, it just has become painful and and debilitating for, for my experience through this. And um, another thing I would encourage people to do, and I'm doing this a little more is reach out you know, a find, find what makes you happy and create that sort of normalcy. And you can, it, it, you just have to find it and commit to it, but also reaching out to people, tell people, if you feel lonely, tell people I'm struggling, I feel alone and scared and tell them what you need from them and, and, and ask them if they can help with that. Um, people, And then people always say this to me. They always say, well, I hate doing that because I hate feeling like a burden. And my response is always, how does it feel when someone asks you, can you do me a favor? And I always go, I love it when people ask me that. That means that they trust me and they know that I'm reliable. And and when and they always usually say the same thing, unless it's like, well, I don't like it with my husband or my wife, (laughs) because it's always like take out the trash. But (laughs) um, most of the time, people want to feel needed. They want to feel like they can help other people. And so I always follow that up with people love to be able to give back and to be able to help and support. So, um, you know, take advantage of that with the people that you can trust and that know they've got your back, you know, they're going to be there for you. Reach out to, you know, OCD game changers, reach out to advocates, reach out to people when you really need it during this time of uncertainty. Mike, what are your final thoughts on that? I don't know that I have anything that can top that. Uh, <laughs> I liked everything you said. I echo that back. I think this is the benefits of social media. Like, so there's the dark side of social media, but there's the positive side of it. You can reach out to people, seek support. Um, I do think people ultimately want to be helpful and useful and they feel, you know, uh, they feel good when they get asked to provide some kind of help or, or an ear, um, for other people. And I think, yeah, that's, that's probably the best thing we can do in these uncertain times is, you know, take action on the things that you can actually have an effect on. You can have Mm -hmm. an effect on reaching out through email, through zoom, through, you know, uh, FaceTime, whatever it might be. Um, 
you know, you can take action and set up a, a game night with friends. You can, you know, um, I don't game, but you can apparently game with friends, um, you know, through PlayStation mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, you know, these are just sort of, you know, sort of probably bad examples, but um, examples of, of ways that you can reach out. Absolutely. And I would even say, you know, um, therapy has moved online. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I'm not saying all of it, but I'm saying a, a great majority of it is oh, majority. And, you know, people are still accepting cases and, you know, uh, therapists still want to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And it might be, it might be a time to, to look at that. If you're feeling like you can't escape that loneliness and that isolation and you don't really want to reach out to friends, or maybe you really don't have a ton of friends to reach out to. And I think mm -hmm. people are in that position too. Mm -hmm. you know, that they, they, they are wallflowers. They have acquaintances through social media, but no one that they would want to take the risk and reach out to. You okay. reach out to a therapist. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or a peer support. Or a peer support. <laughs> well, Mike, thank you for being on today. Really appreciate your insight and everything. I, lo I love the discussion. I love, I'm, I'm going to totally marinate on the risk thing. It just hadn't occurred to me. And I, you know, I love being able to dive into something that I, that just gives me a little bit of a different and better perspective. So I appreciate that. And I also wanted to give you a shout out to your staff, how fun it was to be able to meet them a couple of days ago. And I, I have gotten a few emails from them. I just can't catch up on the emails till the weekend. So I'll do that. But um, you have a great team and I just really loved being able to share my story with them. And, and I, and I love that I can refer people to your center and feel really good about it. So, so thanks. Well, thank you for having me on. Thanks for stopping by our, our meeting the other day. Everyone was, you know, really enthralled by your story and, and happy to know that OC game changers exist, that you exist, that peer support exists yep. um, and open their eyes to a lot of that stuff. And uh, yeah, glad good. to do it. And thank you to all of you who have shown up today and have taken this fireside chat with us. Uh, happy Friday. God, I feel like I said that like two minutes ago this week. is <laughs> Bye. Um, but I look forward to seeing you next week. I, we, oh, who do we have on next week? I believe we have Chris Bear on from Unstuck. Woo! And then Ryan Pyatt, who is at the Refresh Network. He'll be on on Friday. So exciting week yet again of the OCD Game Changers COVID fireside chats. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. But stay tuned on our Facebook page to find out what times and when and who and everything else. Um, in the meantime, stay safe and we will be in touch.